They call their flag the Morning Star and their country West Papua. They're weeping, not tears of joy, but tears of sorrow about what might have been. For 30 years, the Indonesians have ruled here. But in the turmoil following the downfall of President Suharto, they give the Papuans a brief taste of independence. It's intended to be nothing more than a symbolic gesture. But the Papuans seize the moment. They raise their own flag. They even elect their own president, Chief Te Zelawe, a favorite son. The taste of freedom is short-lived. Before long, their president-elect will be dead. The Morning Star flags will be hidden away, and many of their leaders will be in prison or exile. Until we reach independence, or we regain our independence, the name West Papua will remain in our hearts. This is why I am in exile in Papua New Guinea. Because of my rejectance of Indonesia's continued occupation, I have been here for the last 32 years. The last unknown, they called it the last place on Earth to be explored and mapped. Snow-capped mountains drained by massive rivers, vast highland valleys, swamps and jungles. Nearly a million people speaking 250 separate languages. Coastal people, those inhabiting the swamps and rivers and plains, were the first to be contacted by the outside world. Centuries ago, Macassans came from the Malay Peninsula, looking for sandalwood, bird of paradise feathers, slaves. Papuan is a Malay word. It means frizzy-haired people. Next came the Dutch, tentatively at first, venturing no further than the coastal fringes. These Dutchmen are measuring heads, making European assumptions about the native, degrees of civilization, levels of IQ. Other Dutchmen and Britons and Germans were poring over maps drawing political borderlines through regions not yet even explored. The Europeans were carving up for themselves the world's second biggest island, with the Dutch settling for the western half, they called Netherlands New Guinea. It was not, however, the first place they claimed in these regions, nor was it the most prized. From the 1600s onwards, the jewel in the Dutch colonial crown lay to the west, the fabled Spice Islands, the East Indies. The island archipelago known today as Indonesia. It was here that the Dutch colonials settled in force. For hundreds
hundreds of years, they and the other European nations ignored the big island to the east. No easy riches, rugged terrain, malaria, even headhunters. It was the mid-19th century before the Dutch finally got around to claiming their half, planting the flag. Explorers, anthropologists, traders, planters, missionaries. But it was a token occupation. Right into the 20th century, New Guinea remained for the Dutch an undeveloped colonial backwater. When war came to the Pacific in 1941, the Dutch were swept aside by the invading Japanese. Japan Madarat is in Duluanitu, Ya Meman. Karna Meman Waktu itu, Ya Mandarat. Tetapi tidak bergaul orang kampung tidak bergaul karena Jepang punya istilah itu kurang cocok dengan masyarakat apa sedikit bisa potong tangan tidak ada hukuman yang untuk apa manusia jadi mereka harus mundur diri. Dari sini semua Jepang, tapi tidak ada yang pulang ke Tokyo. Semua harus mati, karena sekutu Amerika Serikat. Number one, Amerika Serikat. Di mandara di sini, di sini, plane, kapal serban, aduh, tidak lihat langit, Amerika. The Americans chose Dutch New Guinea's capital, Hollandia, as their base of operations against the Japanese. The sleepy colonial outpost was transformed. Artificial harbors, five airfields, 200 cinemas. Half a million soldiers passed through Hollandia, going on to fight some of the bloodiest battles of the Pacific War. With the Japanese in full retreat, Americans with time on their hands flew joy rides over the mountainous interior and made an astonishing discovery. Fertile, densely populated valleys, unknown to the outside world. In early 1945, one of the planes crashed into a valley known as the Bellium. There were three survivors. A rescue team parachuted into the Ballium to prepare an airstrip. A newsreel cameraman jumped with them. The anxious days were filled with the excitement of discovering the Valley of Shangri-La, the people never before seen by the outside world gaining their confidence, trading with them. We saw the strange and varied types of these primitive people. We liked them, and they liked us. The stranger's departure was as astonishing as their arrival. Gliders landed in the valley and took the rescue party on board. For the Dani people of the Balium, their first encounter with outsiders was a peaceful affair. That would not always be the case. Here comes the tow plane, low and fast, lower and lower. Now, full power, bang. They're on, they're hooked, there they go. As the war ended, the American departure from Hollandia was equally abrupt. They left behind a vast infrastructure and a cornucopia of stores and equipment. A 
But the Papuans had inherited more from the Americans than abandoned uniforms and musical instruments. They left behind a political vacuum and the gem of an idea that this was their country, no one else's. Local tribal leaders looking for a symbol of cultural identity turned the familiar Dutch flag upside down and added a star. The morning star, we call it Bintang Pagi, it has a lot of uh, meaning to Papuans, especially those who are living on the coast. Because as you go out in the morning, walking on the beach, you see the morning star actually disappearing before the, uh, before the rising of the sun. Sunrise, it is the, the last symbol of the night. And it, to us, it gives us hope. It is also, it gives us direction as to where we should go. Because at night time, fishermen, just like my dad, they used to look at the uh, morning star as to the direction that he was to pedal. And in doing so, it gave him the hope. And uh, to us Papuans, many of us uh, believe that morning star is our symbol of direction. The morning star flag remained a symbol in name only. Because hard on the heels of the departing Americans came the Dutch again, eager to reclaim their East Indies empire. But their colonial subjects had other ideas. Across the archipelago, from Java to Sumatra, they'd seen the Dutch run from the Japanese. The white man was no longer invincible. The cry went up, Merdeka, freedom for an independent Indonesia, united under the revolutionary leader, Sukarno. After four years of fighting, the Dutch withdrew, and backed by the United Nations, the Republic of Indonesia was proclaimed. An overwhelming reception greeted Sukarno in November 1949, when he and other leaders of the independence fighters returned from exile enforced by the Dutch, until then, the rulers of the Netherlands East Indies. It was almost certainly this action of the Dutch, this banishment of the people's leaders, that swung world opinion on the side of the nationalists. For the people, it meant they would never again be a nation of coolies and a coolie among nations. But from this moment, they were the fifth largest nation in the world, and Sukarno, he has no other name, was their president. Without doubt, on the day the flag of the United States of Indonesia flew for the first time, Sukarno was determined his voice would be heard throughout the world. He had a personality, a charisma, which was remarkable. And he was a revolutionary in spirit. Sukarno told me that their idea of independence was from Sabang to Meroki. It was a phrase, of course, which uh, Sukarno, who was a great man for adopting phrases that appeared, appealed to the people, was a war cry from Sabang to Meroki, and that reverberated through the archipelago. And uh, Meroki, you'll know, is in the far east of uh, West New Guinea, very close to the Papua New Guinea border. And uh, Sabang is a little island, a little bit to the west of the west coast of Archie. So it's right in the extreme west. And that was the whole concept of uh, Indonesia, as the Indonesians the, and the nationalists understood it at the time. Sabang sampai Merauke berjajar pulau pulau. I think that sort of thing is mean. There's pulau another pulau and pulau to from Sabang. Yeah, uh, uh, Pulau is island, from island to island, from Sabang to Merauke. Having yielded up most of their empire, the Dutch drew the line at Netherlands New Guinea. They strengthened their military presence and began pouring in people and resources. This was their one remaining colonial toehold, and they would control its future, no one else. Thank you. 
Into this jungle wilderness, the Dutch are pouring each year $25 million. They have sent 6,000 teachers, doctors, scientists, engineers. They are building schools and hospitals, airports, harbor facilities, new housing. The Australian attitude was this was our backyard. There was questions of our security. And it was felt that it would be, uh, we'd feel safer if it was under Dutch control than if it was under Indonesian. And uh, I think basically there was a complete ignorance of just what nationalism meant and how intense nationalist feeling could be. And so we were in the process of changing our policy 180 degrees from being fully supportive of nationalism in Indonesia to being opposed to it. The principal industry of this land behind the mountains is education. Its principal product, the future. The governor of Dutch New Guinea, Dr. Jan van Baal, has explained it. The Papuan, he said, has discovered that the other world, the world of the foreigner, is very rich with all kinds of possibilities for comfortable living, more and better food, better health, longer life and more safety. He wants to participate in our society as an equal who will finally perform the same tasks as the white man. The Dutch administration was faced with uh, the burden of uh, preparing uh, New Guinea, West New Guinea for eventual independence. So, so they devised a scheme whereby uh, after grade three, the brightest ones are then selected to go to a boarding school. So I was lucky enough to be selected, and I was excited about it. The road towards full independence must be peaceful, must be transitional, so that that means the Dutch flag will still fly there for the next 10 years alongside the, uh, uh, the, our, our own flag. And that was the understanding, and we like it. The Dutch were not opposed to Papuan independence, but it would be on Dutch terms, according to a Dutch timetable. They even set a date, the 1st of December, 1970. Families like the Van Klinkens were told the Dutch would be needed in New Guinea for decades. It was all jungle. It was as if you were in a Genesis, in the start of, of the world, if the world had just started. And so I thought of that, and it was an, no, yeah, I thought it was amazing. Well, I was fortunate I was in the police force, and I liked the bush. So I'd only been there a couple of weeks and was sent out on a patrol, five days walk, with uh, all local policemen. And that was very exciting. And beautiful to be in the inland and the mountains and the rivers there. You had to cross them in, in a very primitive sort of a way or swim across. And uh, of course, you went uh, out hunting. And that was a pretty big part of the social life. So I enjoyed it very much. Men's company, I thought at that time. It's really a men's company. They are going out. Anyway, then he said, you come with me and you see what we experience. Oh, the Papuas were absolutely such gentlemen. You have no idea. I thought straight away, this is the experience of my life. I'll never, ever experience this again. I thought it was amazing. The big birds and the pig, they shoot for the evening meal and roast it over the fire. <laughs> But President Sukarno was running out of patience. So we understand that Netherlands is Indies, is part of the sovereignty of the new Indonesia. Because of this, 
in the Dutch, always hold to Papua New Guinea, to, to Irian Jaya. Therefore, Sukarno, as a first president proclamator, felt that his, uh, you know, Indonesia is not united. Therefore, they had to endeavor to try to get this, to bring the Papua to the motherland of Indonesia. Indonesian soldiers began parachuting into the jungles of Dutch New Guinea. In 1962, Operation Mandala was commanded by an ambitious young colonel named Suhato. We were shocked because after all those promises of uh, a 10 year program towards independence, then suddenly you heard the uh, Tricora or the Operasi Mandala. But Operation Mandala began to go wrong. These poor people, they thought they came as liberators and they would be accepted and welcomed as liberators, but it was not the case at all. Uh, the locals accept, uh, arrested them after they had been there a couple of days and could not find sufficient food. They brought him to the village and they contacted the local village head and he came over and saw all these captive prisoners and uh, he could see that they had not been treated terribly well. He had a few bloody noses and so on. We cannot care for our wounded. Our radio is out of order. The Papuans regard us as enemies and often we have to exchange our uniforms and equipment for food. Lieutenant Cernodo, Indonesian Army officer, April 1962. Sukarno was determined to absorb Netherlands New Guinea into Indonesia. Rebuffed by the West, Australia included, he turned to the communists. Mr. Khrushchev, making a brief call at Bali, was rounding off his 12-day tour of Indonesia. A friendly and attractive welcome had been laid on for him in the famous island. No doubt Indonesians were delighted with his offer of a huge credit in return for neutrality. Anyway, they put on a good show in his honor. But Mr. K was rather tired and very, very hot. President Sukarno evidently noticed it and tried to cheer him up by decorating him with a flower. Strange customs they have in the Far East. But when in Bali, do as the Balinese do. With the Cold War at its height, the West now worried about losing Indonesia to the communists. So they courted Sukarno and leaned on the Dutch. In 1962, President Kennedy persuaded the Dutch to hand over their colony to Indonesia. The deal was brokered at UN headquarters in New York and was called the New York Agreement. The Indonesians would take over from the Dutch under United Nations supervision. But there was one major proviso. Within five years, there would be an act of free choice for the Papuans to go it alone or remain with Indonesia. Hollandia, late 1962. The Dutch flag and the West Papuan Morning Star come down together. For the Dutch, a hasty and unceremonious retreat. For the indigenous Papuans, a Cold War sellout. We were devastated because the New York Agreement was arrived at without the involvement of the Papuans. Right from the beginning, from the process leading up to the ratification of the agreement itself in August uh, 1962. So it was just an imposed uh, agreement. I think the Dutch had vigorously worked out a program, a 10-year program for independence, and suddenly they more or less walk out, and we felt betrayed. As I conclude this report, sir, the atmosphere here is one of uncertainty and sadness. The joy of living has gone from the community. Dutch families are leaving with a few days' notice. 
A considerable number of West Papuans are bound to be resentful if the territory is handed over to the Indonesians without an opportunity for self-government guarantee. Indeed, sir, an unhappy business. P.J. Mollison, Australian Liaison Officer, Hollandia, December 1962. Some people accused us, the Dutch, of treason. We had promised them independence, and now we were handing them over to another country. And they were not happy with that at all. Today, President Sukarno of Indonesia began a triumphal inspection of newly won West New Guinea, which he'll take over from the United Nations later this week. During his tour, he visited the capital Sukarnapura, formerly known as Hollandia, and Meroki, which is near the Papuan border. Pat Burgess, Sukarnapura, April 1963, filing for Reuters News Agency. They came as winner of a war, not against the Dutch, but they're against West Papuans. So they walked in, they come in, and they go everywhere with their full, uh, like, and war path on the barrel of the gun. The Indonesian military came in, led by militia group, the Indonesian set up. Uh, they were the informant. They are the one who pinpoint who, who the military should beat, should shoot, or should arrest. So one time they came to me. So I was grabbed on my throat. And then I was trying to look at back who was uh, playing with me. But then you know, quickly the bicycle chain landed on my left cheek. And then the hole was cut all the way down. And then uh, it's not only me. Uh, so many upcoming students, promising leaders were beaten up, like my experience. Some even shot dead. President Sukarno announced that there would be no act of free choice. By 1965, Indonesian authority was firmly entrenched in the new province. But Sukarno's glittering victories were not enough to save him from the ambitions of others. I, President, Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces of the Republic of Indonesia, appoint Major General Suharto Regiment and I, ha I appoint him as uh, Minister Commander of the Army. Within two years, General Suharto had become President Suharto and had taken complete control in Indonesia. A vote of self-determination in 1969. This is the one concession handed to the Dutch when they yielded their colony to Indonesia five years ago. President Sukarno repudiated the agreement. President Suharto has now reluctantly agreed to play out the diplomatic charade. But West Irian is Indonesian, he says. The vote will be a mere formality. The Indonesians carried out the act of choice by something which was traditional in their own country, namely the process of what's called mushawara. Uh, mushawara is a process by which um, issues are considered and resolved through meetings, consultations, discussions aimed at a consensus. Uh, it's a process for involving everybody in a decision. Now, uh, it also has the purpose of securing the initial objective by those who want the outcome, because such processes are dominated by uh, the most powerful and the most influential people who set the stage and the tone and the setting. 
I expected that if the United Nations was holding an act of free choice, that th there would be a, a voting system. And, uh, and when I got there, I was surprised to find out that they were selecting people who would then vote. And they're only going to select 1,025 in the whole country. One of the main reasons I wanted to cover it was that I knew no one else was going to because President Nixon of the United States was making a three-week tour through Southeast Asia at exactly the same time as the act of free choice was going to be taking place. And so all the correspondents who'd been to West Irian to preview the act of free choice were told to stay at home stay in Bangkok, stay in Hong Kong, stay in Taiwan, stay in Jakarta. And I was told by Reuters to stay in Jakarta. So it, it was effectively, uh, I, I believe, the Americans decided to stop anyone from covering the act of free choice so that Indonesia could just absorb the place with nothing written. On the island of Biak in West Irian, they were going to select six people who are going to take part in the act of free choice. So together with the four UN officials, I went along to watch and uh, several hundred um, Papuans gathered and the uh, lots of Indonesians were there and, they, and all of the Papuans were very sullen and standing there like this because they were very unhappy about it. And then all of a sudden there was a kerfuffle and out of the bush at the side came these three men and a boy carrying a sign, carrying several signs, one of which said one, one vote. It didn't say one man, one vote, it said one, one vote. And the Indonesians immediately arrested them. And as soon as the, as the thing was over, they marched them off at gunpoint. Large numbers of hand-picked local people were assembled in big halls and a rather ritualistic process ensured, culminating in everybody in the room putting up their hands in favour of integration. Now, when you looked at those people, the, the, the ones that I observed, it was clear enough from the body language of some of the participants they were opposed to it. But because of the atmosphere, perhaps, or fear of reprisals to themselves and their families or bribery, they voted. We then took uh, to the streets. That's how we mobilized the uh, 5,000 uh, youth, women, and the masses to demonstrate in the major center of the city of Jayapura. And so the uh, crowd gathered together to the main square of the city. And as we were standing, people started singing. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching us to war, something like that. And we all joined in, and we were clapping hands and we walked on the street. And uh, mind you, the military was not very happy. And they start shooting. They realize this is a serious matter, so they pull the tanks out of their hiding places, pull out the tanks, line up on the road, and start shooting. And that the, the, the demonstrators disperse. We were, in fact, actually we were standing underneath the uh, parliament uh, building. And as we were standing, one uh, Christian Indonesian, he came and whispered to both of us, both of you are now in danger. Now that you're standing in public, you will be in danger. So we left everything, nothing, just run for life. Pursued by the Indonesian military, Clemens Ranawari and Wim Zonganau fled across the border to Australian-administered Papua New Guinea. But their ultimate goal was New York and United Nations headquarters, where they planned to tell the world that the act of free choice 
was a farce. They were thwarted by Australian officials under pressure from Indonesia. The immediate concern of Indonesia is that the early arrival of these two West Irianese at the United Nations could stimulate defiance and seriously upset the management of conduct of the act of choice within West Irian. June 1969. Songanao and Ranaweri were forcibly prevented from traveling to New York. As we were about to board the plane, master of the Manus province, he came rolling up with a limousine type of a vehicle with the Australian flag, little flag, symbolizing the power of Australia, symbolizing the power of uh, colonialism here in PNG Dan. The man looks like an authoritarian type too. So he you know, put his hands in his hips and said, you two guys, Songo now and Runaweri, you come down or, or I arrest you. So we said, uh, well, we got ticket, we got everything. Uh, we are on the way to leave this country. So and then he said, you are under arrest. So policemen came, grabbed our hands, took us down. Well, the, the tears were dropping, and yeah. uh, that was the end of it. The Australian authorities detained the pair on Manus Island until the act of free choice was over. Their complaints were never heard. At Jakarta's golf club, one of President Suharto's regular partners was Australia's ambassador to Indonesia, Gordon Jockel. I did play golf with Suharto and I thought it would be an opportunity to convey to him some of my impressions and to bring home to him the, um, that while the act of choice was, had, uh, had um, worked, that there were very long-term uh, problems which would require a lot of attention and uh, sensitive handling. But as soon as I mentioned that I'd been there, and he's a very impassive man, but his face lit up and beamed and he said, wasn't it wonderful, he said. The way they responded and their enthusiasm in joining Indonesia. Mm, so I just hit my next shot. <laughs> the game was over. West Papua was now West Irian, the 26th province of Indonesia. And the rewards were more tangible than mere national prestige. There was Freeport, one of the richest gold and copper mines in the world. Great holes gouged from the Star Mountains, polluted lowland streams. And there was land, lots of it, ripe for closer settlement. The program was called Transmigration. Landless peasants from the crowded islands of Java and Sumatra poured into Irian Jaya, doubling the population. There were problems in the new province, not simply due to the sudden population changes. The coastal Papuans had a long history of contact with outsiders. The people of the remote highland valleys did not, and they resisted Indonesian rule. There were bloody uprisings in the Baliam Valley, but with severe travel restrictions, it was out of sight, out of mind. The heart of the problem, a profound clash of cultures. To a Muslim Javanese soldier on duty at a guard post, the black man in a penis court driving a pig before him is a demonic and deeply abhorrent being. He is a caricature of humanity, from whom the soldier withholds all contact except violence. Australian biologist and writer, Tim Flannery, 1998. During the 1970s, missionaries were among the few outsiders allowed into the Baliam Valley to work with the Dani people. 
the idea was that to bring in larger aircraft into um, Tiom, and so we were going to uh, enlarge the airstrip there. I was involved with one of the other missionaries in uh, supervising the work. And so some occasions we'd have up to uh, 5,000 natives working with their primitive digging sticks and jute bags carrying the dirt from one side of the airstrip to the other and it was quite a uh, heavy manpower type of um, project. During the construction, a um, platoon from Indonesian soldiers had walked in and we were unaware of this, they came in overnight. The next morning, the um, Dani population uh, who were working the airstrip were running up and down doing some of their traditional dances to compact the, the ground. And uh, the Indonesian soldiers who had moved in overnight and saw this and presumed that they were being um, attacked and um, set up uh, machine guns and other weapons and uh, knee-jerk reactions started firing at the people working on the airstrip. They were firing over their heads, um, but uh, some, I think, eight or nine bullets went through our house and uh, there were some close calls. With the whole systematic oppressive situation that they experienced for four decades, through their history that manipulated the human rights violations that they have experienced every day, the exploitation of their resources, the degradation of their culture, of being a people in their own land. That structured the Papuans into a world that I describe as a broken soul. They are frustrated. Uh, they don't have any hope. Full of anger. And they won't just get out from that situation. Frustration and anger spawned the OPM, the Free Papua Movement. For several decades, the OPM has taken hostages, carried out sabotage, killed Indonesian soldiers. But internal dissension over policy and leadership has kept it marginalized. Another voice of resistance found expression in this man, Chief Tay Zalaway who emerged in the 1990s as the undisputed leader of the West Papuan independence movement. His cause was given a massive boost by the downfall of Suharto and his replacement by President Abdurrahman Wahid, who seemed truly committed to resolving human rights issues peacefully in Indonesia. In the year 2000, Wahid renamed the province again, calling it Papua, and invited all Papuans, including political exiles, to return. After spending more than half his life in exile, Clemens Ranaweri was able to go home. Thank you, terima kasih. It's beautiful to be back in your own home. There is no place like home. We are in a suburb that was once built by the Dutch. For the Papuans, a beautiful suburb with nice houses. It was not as big as this time, but it was beautifully and perfectly built. <laughs> now you can hear the sound of uh, Muslim sound in the midst of what was once Melanesia. So strange, but that's the reality. President Wahid now did an extraordinary thing. He allowed the Papuans to come together at a congress in Jayapura to discuss the future of the province. Well, this is the day, the D day, the D day. 
Eh, berarti mati, mati atau merdeka, merdeka itu merdeka, merdeka. For the first time in decades, Papuans were allowed to sing their national anthem without fear of imprisonment. Congress declared the independent state of West Papua and elected Chief Tays Eloway its first president. vividly was that he advocated peace and he said if we advance our struggle towards gaining our independence we need to pursue it through the corridor within the corridor of peace and love and uh, oh it it caught my attention and I thought this is the man this is Luther King this is Mahatma Gandhi this is Aung San Suu Kyi in West Park How can you imagine the 2.2 million people, low education, the infrastructure, lack of infrastructure, can survive in the current uh, globalization era? The sort of things you have to think. So for our friend, Papuan, let's join, join the, come back to Indonesia. Indonesia is a great country. There's benefit for you, benefit for us, we can build together. in the Indonesian province of West Papua, formerly Irian Jaya, have found a mutilated body, believed to be that of kidnapped independence leader Teus Elway. Members of his family say Elway went missing late yesterday after a group of unidentified men ambushed his car. The murder of Teus Elway is a, a political assassination. 
after the murder of Taisel Wai, the witnesses, including the human rights activists and the police of Papua in Jayapura, being intimidated and terrorized by the Kapasos. The message is very clear. Chief Tais was killed purely because of Indonesians' fear that his continuous presence within and amongst Papuans will bring disintegration. People loved him. Wherever he went, in towns and in villages, they admired him. He, was, he became a charisma. He became a magnet pulling people around. And I think that was a threat, a real threat to Indonesia rather than a bullet or a barrel of a gun. Since Chief Tay's death, Indonesia is firmly back in control in Papua under President Megawati Sukarnoputri. Remember, Sukarno is one of nationalists, very strong nationalism. Megawati is very strong nationalism. Follow her father. And I think that's the key to Indonesia. You know, the nationalism, this mean is very important to Indonesia. Nationalism means the country cannot divide it from Sabang to Merauke. They can give away in some part of the like uh, uh, special autonomy in Aceh and Papua, but do not try to separate from their mother, uh, mother, motherland, mother country from in, from central government. In the Indonesian province of Papua, it's once more illegal to fly the Morning Star flag, and Clemens Ranawari is once more living in exile on the eastern side of the island in Papua New Guinea. Di pantai onakei di waktu terang bulan Ku duduk sambil merenung Di sana lenumbai negeriku yang ku cinta Kapan ku lihat kembali Ku di pantai onake di waktu terang bulan ku duduk sambil merenung di sana lenumbai negeriku yang ku cinta kapan ku lihat kembali